Hi, I'm Sasha Salzman, speaking to you from Globale, Festival für Grenzüberschreitende Literatur, and my guest today is Masha Gessen, an award-winning journalist, author of 11 books, political thinker and activist who has been an outspoken critic of autocracies worldwide, starting with their home country, Russia, reporting on places like Chechnya, Belarus, Kosovo, and Israel, becoming the major observer and critic of their second home country, the United States, where Masha Gessen lives today. Masha Gessen is the staff writer of The New Yorker. Their columns and articles are highly recommended. In Germany, um, Masha Gessen got a lot of attention for their portrait of Vladimir Putin, Der Mann ohne Gesicht, followed by the fascinating story on the mathematician Grigori Perlman in 2014. In 2019, Masha, you got awarded with the Leipziger Buchpreis zur Europäischen Verständigung and the National Book Award for Nonfiction for The Future is History, Die Zukunft ist Geschichte. Masha's article, Autocracy Rules for Survival, written in the night after Donald Trump's election victory, went crazy viral and became sort of the ground for the book we want to discuss today, Surviving Autocracy, Autokratie, Überwinden. I'm so delighted to speak to you today. Welcome, Masha Gessen. Thank you. It's good to be here. Masha, so your book is sort of divided in three parts. You start with institutions, then you go to language and media, and close with us. Um, sort of like thinking about who Americans are, what America is, um, coming from the myth of being a nation of immigrants, right, um, to a status quo of um, an exclusive society of rich white heterosexual elites. And I'd like to follow your dramaturgy with my question to start with the institutions, also because we're in Germany, we tend to have like nearly a religious belief in our institutions, despite that everything that happened on German ground. So um, your first rule in the article, uh, Rules for Survival, is um, belief the autocrat. He means exactly what he says. The second one is do not be taken in by small signs of normality. And the third one is the institutions will not save you. So let's start there. Why will institutions not hold the weight of an autocratic attempt? Well, I think Americans, I don't know if we share this with Germans or if it's distinct, but Americans also have a religious belief in institutions. Mm -hmm. In fact, um, Constitution is the, the Constitution is America's civil religion, uh, and all constitutional institutions are sort of the you know uh, the 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 emissaries of that religion on earth. Right, and I think you know Americans really do, uh, and now more than or not now, but in 2016 more than ever before, I think believe that um, the founding fathers created a perfect system mm. and our job is just to maintain it, you know, spack a little bit, paint the walls every so often, but basically live in it. And it's a weird idea of democracy. Uh, and I think a fundamentally flawed, one, right? It's the idea of democracy as a built, almost as a built environment Mm -hmm. rather than an idea, a dream, an aspiration, which is what I think democracy is. Mm -hmm. um, and despite this idea that democracy is static and um, in a set of institutions, America, for most of its history, if you look sort of generously enough and in a large enough time span, has moved toward democracy. So been fundamentally democratic in the sense that it has ex uh, enfranchised more people over time. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that trajectory has changed. But anyway, uh, on the eve and around the time of the election of Donald Trump, there was this prevalent idea that, okay, he's terrible, but our institutions are so strong. And I think there are three misunderstandings inherent in that idea. One that institutions are, um, you know, uh, uh, that democracy is institutions, which is what I just mentioned. Two, that everything we think of as normal is institutions. In fact, most of it is norms, uh, it's expectations, it's customs. So, you know, things like a, a daily 
televised White House press briefing, mm -hmm. which is something that I mentioned in that essay uh, in November 2016, but don't count on that staying. You know, and that seemed like a pretty wild conjecture at the time. And now who even remembers that there used to be daily televised White House press briefings? Well, we in do. Fact, well, we remember it, but you know, it, we almost remember it as an abstraction. Mm -hmm. um, it really doesn't feel real anymore that that exists. And you know, and that's, that, that's just one example of a norm and, uh, and an expectation rather than an institution. And finally, and probably most important, institutions are built for good faith actors. There's this myth that um, if you just design a good enough institution, it can withstand anything. But that's not true. No institution can stand up to an abuser. No institution can stand up to somebody who's using it in bad faith. And Donald Trump was very explicitly from the very beginning a bad faith actor. Right? And he has continued to launch an attack on American institutions, which is of course the main reason that they haven't been able to save us. Right. I'd like to quote something very beautiful from your book. You say, um, one might say that Trump acted at once the emperor and the boy who screams that the emperor has no clothes on, um, ripping the illusory cover of decency off the system, right? This is, this is pretty much what you describe, especially in the first part when you speak about the institutions. And coming to democracy, it's very interesting to me because, you know, um, America, as, as the image goes, is one of the oldest democracies. Um, immigrants like my parents and me, we like always dreamed about this one particular land of the free, right? And um, so there is this promise of make America great again, which somehow refers to this lie, uh, the old lie of American democracy. Uh, and, but there is also a make America great again uh, from the de democratic side, which Biden represents, which is like a pre-Trump normal, right? I have a feeling that there is a big uh, promise to the voter, if you vote for the Democrats, we bring you to this pre-Trumpian -Trump times. And a lot of people are sick with it, right? And they're like, I mean, they're on the streets, they're in the media saying, we don't want to go back to so-called normal. That was not normal for us. And especially in the core of what democracy is, stands, of course, the right to vote. And voter suppression is uh, major in the United States. And if we take a look at the Electoral Integrality Index, um, United States is ranked last, right? Uh, among all the Western democracies. And it struck me because I never thought of uh, America as being something similar to the country where I come from, which is Russia. So um, I found in your book this sentence I really wanted to ask you about. You say um, that if America wants to be a democracy, it has to reinvent itself. Can you speak a bit about what reinvention you imagine? Um, so well, first of all, let me challenge you a little bit. Um, I don't think elections are central to democracy. Okay. Um, I think that election, uh, that democracy, if we're very lucky under the best of circumstances can be facilitated by elections. Okay. That's in the best case scenario, right? Um, but you know, like the, the, the Athenians were deeply suspicious of elections. You know why? Because because elections they suspected may bring to power the aristocracy and the wealthy. You know, they would favor the wealthy and the educated. So it would be an oligarchy of the aristocracy, <clears throat> which is of course exactly what we get, right? Yeah. We get a system that, uh, that almost by, by definition, you know, favors the educated and the wealthy, mm -hmm. uh, which is where you know, the, the American idea of democracy crosses with the American idea of meritocracy. And um, that's, you know, the, the, how that, uh, how we, we, we reconcile that with the idea of the government of the governed is not entirely clear to me. Right? Uh, so there's actually an alternative to elections in, in the philosophy of democracy, which is certition. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is <clears throat> basically a lottery system that is similar to the way that in the United States we select juries. Mm -hmm. right? uh, 
on the assumption that a representative selection of citizens are in fact the, the people who can bear the responsibility, who can make the wisest decisions, ultimately the most important, um, the, the weightiest decisions to be made in a democracy, which are you know, decisions about a person's freedom right, and decisions about justice. Right. So we entrust those decisions to people chosen at random by lottery, but then we think of government in technocratic terms uh, of competence, which is where we get into meritocracy, which is where we have you know, these elections that are more like casting contests and, um, and job interviews. Right. And you know, I think that the, the relationship to democracy is quite approximate. Uh, so that's one of the things that we would need to rethink. Uh, we don't necessarily, you know, I don't necessarily imagine the United States giving up elections altogether, but we certainly have to completely change the way we think about elections and the way we carry out elections. Uh, at this point, all candidates buy their way into office. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, not in the way that candidates buy their way into office in Eastern, in some Eastern European countries where they just literally, you know, pay for office. Buy it. Just buy it. But, but by raising money, by making promises, by, um, <clears throat> you know, I was on a panel with the late David Graeber last year uh, in which he called it bribery. And, you know, I don't, I don't think that's entirely wrong, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, they... There are promises that they make in return for the money that they receive that enables them to get into office. Uh, that's the way the system works, and we consider it legitimate. Um, so that you know, that's something we would have to reinvent. Uh, we would have to reinvent uh, our ideas about how we live together as a society, as cities, as communities, as states. Um, how we are part of the global community. And that means rethinking, uh, I mean, probably the central thing that we need to rethink right now is public education, mm -hmm. which at the moment is, uh, you know, the pandemic is really forcing, I wouldn't say it's forcing a reckoning because a reckoning suggests that there would, there's an active conversation and, um, uh, and you know, a public conversation about it, which there kind of isn't, but the pandemic is certainly exposing the absolute rot of the public education system in mm. the United States, mm. where um, you know, I mean, in the in the in my city of, of New York, uh, the unequal distribution of resources among schools has become so clear as a result of the pandemic. And some children continue to get an education even in the public schools. Mm -hmm. And some children just don't. And some children are falling hopelessly behind. Right. Uh, and some children are, you know, like I think my eight-year-old is actually living his best eight-year-old life in this pandemic. There's no after school, he gets all sorts of parental attention. Uh, he, his class is six kids. Oh. Uh, he, only, he only goes to school every other week, which I think is pretty perfect actually for a school schedule. Um, so, you know, that's something we would, we would have to reinvent. We have to reinvent welfare. Uh, now, you mentioned the, uh, what Biden represents, uh, uh, and you said that he represents a return to a pre-Trump and normal. I think it's a little bit more complicated than that. I think that his Campaign slogan is actually not terrible, uh, as hokey as it sounds. His campaign slogan is "Build Back Better," uh, and I think that to the extent that somebody who has spent his entire life in, in the American political system, and who really, I think, is justifiably proud of his ability and his expertise at navigating that system, uh, for someone like that, uh, Biden has actually been extraordinarily imaginative. Mm -hmm. I think in some ways his presidency can be transformative. Uh, I think that, that he, uh, 
he is in a position to address fundamental issues such as welfare, such as healthcare, such as public education, uh, such as climate policy. What he is not in a position to address is how we think about what democracy is, mm -hmm. right? He's not in a position to address the workings of the political system that he's so good at working. He's not in a position to address uh, the marriage of money and power uh, in this country. He's maybe in a position to mitigate it slightly, but he's not in a position to, 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 to force a reinvention. Right. So, but let's let's move a bit to language, but stay with Biden and also Trump, um, and also with you, because you've been um, a Russian journalist and you describe very beautifully in your book how after the fall of the wall, journalists like you uh, had to reinvent the Russian language because it was so abused and misused by the Soviet regime that you basically just stick to verbs and nouns and exactly the thing you observed. Um, no metaphors, no emotional language, uh, as far as I. I got you. And if we look at Trump, okay, this is obvious. He's hyper emotional. He conducts his crowd. He wants them to love, to boo, to fall in love with him. And it's interesting because if you watch the Democrats doing the rallies, it's kind of the same. They, they take their people to church. It's beautiful to watch. You know what I mean? Like you want to scream, yeah, exactly, after every sentence. And I think that this is uh, not an American thing. It's like people around the globe want Hollywood. They want emotions. They want an emotional journey when they listen to someone or they read their text. So with your expertise uh, with reporting on Perestroika in the years after in Russia, and now reporting on the United States and on the West, do you still think that it's the right thing to stick to verbs and nouns? And if yes, how do we get the attention of the reader and the trust of the voter by just sticking to facts in this crazy times of Facebook and you know all the noise around us? Um, no, no, not at all. No, I don't. I, I okay. never meant to say that you should stick to verbs and nouns. Okay. What I actually meant to say is that. Um, it was a forced solution and a tragic one, right? Um, in uh, in, in post-Soviet journalism, uh, that's what we had to do uh, because so much language had been discredited, right? Totalitarianism mobilized people's emotions, uh, you know, because totalitarianism is a mobilizational kind of regime, right? It wants its people out in the public square, very much like Donald Trump does. Right? I mean, Donald Trump is building a totalitarian movement. Uh, he's not building a totalitarian regime, but he's building a totalitarian movement. And that movement is built on you know, this mass mobilization, mm -hmm. by which I mean mobilization of the masses. And, um, <clears throat> and so that's, that's what the Soviet Union did. Right? This, uh, discrediting that language of mobilizing emotion. Uh, and the Soviet Union also discredited the language of politics and the language of ideology and the language of ideals. So um, we had in post-Soviet journalism to stick to verbs and nouns, to directly observable facts, because, uh, you know, and that was impoverishing. Uh, I think it's, uh, I, felt, I felt so much better because I was, you know, I had the very strange experience of, for many years of writing about languages in parallel, sometimes writing the same stories in two languages for two different audiences, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes just writing uh, consistently in two languages. And I enjoyed writing in English a lot more because I had so much more freedom in English. Interesting. Because I could use the language of emotions, because I could use the language of ideals, um, because, because I could, you know, I, uh, there was so much more amplitude to, to what I could do. Now, um, I am not at all an opponent of emotions and politics. I think that politics, um, politics is experiential, politics is emo emotional. Uh, there is a place for, I mean, there's a need for love in politics. Uh, otherwise, uh, I mean, politics is not a system of rational management. Mm -hmm. Politics is the invention of common life or in the constant reinvention of common life. And of course, emotions play a huge role <clears throat> in that. What I fear is that Trump is making, uh, you know, his abuse of language is making things difficult for us in the present and the future. 
and we have to be super careful about that. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to be watchful uh, for the, the Trumpian language that we amplify in order to avoid the predicament that we're in as post-Soviet journalists. See. See that I wish you, you could tell that or we can make it clear to German politicians who are like just sticking to verbs and nouns and it's so mm -hmm. horrible to watch them that you really don't want to do you really don't care um so emotions are really lacking there and uh, they also I don't think un underestimate the moment of performance that you're there to speak to a public and that it is basically theater um you you are, are argued in an article um the New Yorker uh, or you described um the, the kind of like opponents in journalism, you have objectivity versus moral clarity, right? And and that was very interesting to me because I I didn't see this discussion among you know German journalists, and I wonder if you could say something about is there like are those really opponents or can it be like the same thing? Can it be objective and be moral clear? Um, well, I don't know you know what the objectivity discourse is in, in German journalism. In American journalism, it has some very specific traits, and I think they are really specific to American mm -hmm. journalism. Right? So originally, uh, the, the concept of objectivity was introduced into American journalism in the 1920s, 30s by a group of, uh, of writers who really were looking for ways to create a system of greater transparency in journalism. And they came up with the idea of borrowing approaches from the, uh, from the sciences and approaching uh, reportage as an experiment. Mm -hmm. So um, a hallmark of a scientific experiment is that it has to be reproducible. And in order for an experiment to be reproduced, you have to supply, you know, to, to include in your paper all the givens, the circumstances under which the result was obtained. So that if another scientist wanted to replicate your experiment, they could use all, you know, all the same I don't know, amount of chemicals or, um, or, or whatever it is, you know, to reproduce all the condi conditions and see if they come up with the same result. That's sort of the gold standard that we apply to medical papers, pharmaceutical papers, chemical papers, physical papers, mathematical papers, blah, blah, blah. Um, So this group of, of, of writers said, let's, let's try to do the same in journalism. That's where American journalism gets its conventions of sourcing. Right? Uh, the idea is that if you, get, if you went to all the same people and asked them all the same questions, you would get all the same answers and end up with the same story. I mean, it's a little bit of a silly idea because, of course, you wouldn't, uh, because you're you and I'm me, and and would ask different follow-up questions and <clears throat> and would understand the answers differently because journalism is not science. But that's the idea of objectivity, and I think it's it's really still a very beautiful idea. Somehow, in American journalistic convention and mainstream media, it has over time morphed into this idea of neutrality mm -hmm. and yeah. the idea that there's no view, that there's or what Jay Rosen, a media scholar at New York University calls the view from nowhere. As though you could tell a story without telling the reader where you stand in relationship to that story, you could paint a picture without placing yourself anywhere in relationship to the picture. In a sense, that's the opposite of objectivity. Mm -hmm. You actually have to tell us where you are in the picture in order for us to be able to understand mm -hmm. how to look at this picture. Right? So um, as a result, you know, what, uh, because, because, because that kind of neutrality <coughs> is physically and intellectually impossible, um, <clears throat> what actually happens is that a sort of unmarked space is created, um, a space where assumptions are not uh, questioned. So 
if I view a story from the point of view, <clears throat> or if I tell a story from the point of view of a person of color, a woman, a trans person, a queer person, uh, an immigrant, then my position is marked. But if I tell the story from nowhere, then I am the unmarked in the society, which is a white cisgender man. Okay. That is how American media language is constructed. <clears throat> and moral clarity stands in opposition to that idea of objectivity. Right. Moral clarity is, <clears throat> I mean, most recently this debate broke out this summer when uh, a wonderful African-American journalist named Wesley Morris, uh, not Wesley Morris, uh, what is his name, Wesley, God, I'm blanking his name. Uh, but he's, he's, a, he's a young journalist who was with the Washington Post for a number of years and is now with 60 Minutes who really pioneered this, uh, uh, I mean, he was one of the, one of the engines of, of the Washington Post database of police killings of black men, mm -hmm. um, which fundamentally changed the story in the United States and has played a huge role in sort of mainstreaming uh, the Black Lives Matter movement. So uh, Wesley Clark, and um, he tweeted that it's time to, uh, to drop you know, that kind of objectivity in favor of moral clarity. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of pushback, as though he were attacking, you know, um, mainstream media itself, which he kind of was. I see. Yeah. Of course he was. Yeah. <laughs> so. I see. Um, so um, media around the globe is discussing Trump's promise, right? And you have a very clear answer, I think. I mean, it's very complex, but to break it down to a thing that's really interesting to me is that Trump promised people to go back to an imaginary past that really never existed. You're gonna be safe there. It's gonna be warm there. I take care of the rest. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, particularly interesting to me personally also because this is how you describe Putinism too. Right. Um, now, Russia and United States are coming from such different historical paths that it's really, it's really difficult for me to understand how did we end up being so similar or aren't we? Well, um, you know, it reminds me of, of, a, of a funny conversation I had <clears throat> with this wonderful Russian-Israeli political scientist named Mikhail Filipov uh, when I was uh, doing reporting there on, you know, Russian voting behavior <clears throat> in um, in Israel, you know, and Russians have been um, uh, have have had a disastrous effect on um, on Israel, yeah, on Israel, yeah, 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 and um, and so Misha Filipov here is saying that he had like he said, you know. I studied them for so uh, for such a long time, and I had this whole sort of theory worked out for why Russian uh, 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 you know, Russian Israeli voting behavior was the way it was, and it had to do with the Soviet with their Soviet background, and it had to do with the fact that they were mostly educated as engineers, uh, and um, you know had this idea that like there's an there's a perfect solution to everything, and. Uh, which is, I think is a, such a great idea, right? Uh, there's a perfect yeah. solution, one right solution to everything as opposed to democracy, which is always an imperfect solution, right? It's like the art of the imperfect solution. Okay. So, uh, so yeah, this like beautiful idea. And then he said, and then all of Israel started voting this way. Oh, yeah. So then he said, well, I thought, you know, what, <laughs> like I have to revisit my ideas and uh, and what if I'm wrong about uh, about everything? Like there's a whole other set of, uh, of reasons for this. And he said, just as I was like developing a new theory, America voted in Trump. <laughs> was it us? Are you saying that it was us? <laughs> uh, I don't think it was us, but I think, and I don't think, uh, I don't think he was not saying it's Russian. <laughs> what he was saying is that there is probably a more universal human uh, imperfection at play. 
Uh, and, um, you know, I, 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 when I was writing The Future is History, which is, which is a book about uh, the, the how totalitarianism reclaimed Russia, I, um, I used the work of Eric Fromm, who was yeah. writing about Nazi Germany. And his theory is, I mean, it's deceptively, deceptively simple and I think absolutely brilliant, which is that there are times in human history when, uh, when the future becomes for a lot of people too much to contemplate. It is the source of extreme anxiety because they feel economically uh, unstable, socially dislocated, and they lose their ability to imagine a future, or at least imagine a future without fear. Some people thrive in that, uh, you know, in, in, in that space of opportunity. But most people actually find it to be too much. It's, it's their anxiety is too high, and they want to hand over their agency to somebody, anybody, just to get rid of that anxiety. He says, and that's when you have a Martin Luther or an Adolf Hitler come along and say, I'm going to take away your agency. And in exchange, I'm going to transport you back to an imaginary past. And I'm going to give you certainty. Mm -hmm. Right. And, um, and I think that that's what, we're, what, what we have in the United States. We have on the one hand, uh, you know, true economic instability, uh, you know, is a st stagnation and just, you know, a lack of any kind of economic uh, uh, future for a huge number of people, a sense of a complete lack of social safety net, uh, in unaddressed psychic trauma of the financial and housing crisis of 2008. Right. Mm -hmm. right? Um, a desire to just, just be comfortable, you know, social dislocation that has to do uh, with the United States uh, changing demographically and, uh, um, you know, and tapping into racist anxiety and racial anxieties uh, in the US. And then you have D Donald Trump come along and speak directly to those anxieties while the Democrats are not speaking to those anxieties. Mm -hmm. And I think Joe Biden is in his own way, in the sort of kindly uncle way, much better at speaking to those anxieties than, than Hillary was. I see. Well, that might be also the fact that Hillary is a woman, but like it's, 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 yeah. it's for sure complex. But sticking for a second with the promise of the imaginary past, for me personally, another thing is very important, and this is the LGBT rights. You, you wrote in the New York Review of Books Why Autocrats Fear LGBT Rights, I'm quoting now, queer rights are a frontier, sometimes the frontier in the global turn towards autocracy. And I feel it's very important also for us in Europe to hear why. Um, yeah, so I, th um, I think there are two reasons uh, and they're interconnected. One is because the autocrats uh, universally rise on this promise of a return to the imaginary past. And now I have to say, I've, like, I've been like saying all over the place that Eric Fromm wrote uh, that it's a return to the imaginary past. It turns out he didn't. He wrote about the past and sort of the promise of a return to the past. The imaginary past is something that I uh, wrote in the future is history using his ideas. Mm -hmm. And then like I've been going all over the place attributing it to him as a phrase. <laughs> and recently I Googled it, realized, no, it's not his phrase, that's my phrase. It's your phrase. Uh, but the concept is his. The concept of like a you know a return to to the past is his. <clears throat> so, so this um, the, uh, the so they they rise to power on the on the on the promise of the imaginary past, and then uh, in order to to show that this is happening, and also to you know to give people a sense of comfort, they have to reverse the most recent. Uh, social change okay. mm -hmm. and that just happens to be almost universally globally lgbt rights mm -hmm. the, the changes in perceptions in the status of lgbt people and the openness of lgbt people you know have been drastic have been incredibly fast uh in the last you know 10 20 years all over the western world and beyond 
So I think that's one reason. Another reason is that LGBT um, people are inventors of our own identity. This is something that makes LGBT people very different from many other minorities, right? LGBT people are not raised by other LGBT people. LGBT people do not come of age in LGBT communities, you know. Maybe in the future, uh, though. I'm sorry? Uh, maybe in the future. Unlikely, right? I mean, um, probably more, more now than, you know, uh, 10 years yeah. ago. But no, generally speaking, uh, it's, it is perceived rightly by a majority of people as an invented identity as an invented, uh, as, as people who are actually inventing their own futures, which of course is exactly the thing that's so frightening, that's so anxiety provoking uh, at these moments of dislocation and instability. Right. So um, talking about Erich Fromm, um, you, you mentioned that in your essay, which is in Germany, published in the book, uh, Leben mit Exil, Living with Exile, and also um, in the book you mentioned, um, Die Zukunft des Geschichte, um, The Freedom From and The Freedom To. And speaking about America as the land of the free, right? The big slogan. Oh my God, you have the whole zoo behind you. There's a cat and a dog, right? <laughs> yes, They're just, just a cat and a dog, yeah. Beautiful. So, um, <laughs> um, thinking about the land of the free, um, I imagine that your parents in the 80s wanted to go to the land of the free. My parents dreamed of it in the 90s. They ended up in Europe, but anyhow, they wanted, that was the imagery. And um, it's interesting to me, especially because if I think what freedom means to us in Germany today, it's a term occupied by the left and we mean open borders, we want to decide who we want to marry, which gender we are, that kind of things. And safety is occupied by the right. And they mean close borders, more police, camera surveillance, I decide who you are, very obvious. But when I, when I watch uh, American media, it's kind of like the opposite. I have the feeling that the right occupied the term freedom because when they say, last time I checked it was a free country, they mean, I'm not going to wear a mask and protect you. So I was wondering about your ideas on American freedom and if there is an ideal freedom that can really bring people together instead of dividing them. Right. So, um, so the, yeah, this is related to, to Fromm and to, to other theorists who've written about two kinds of freedom, right? There's, uh, Fromm had the freedom to and freedom from. Uh, other theorists have had, you know, sort of on the political side, uh, uh, on the psychological side, have had positive freedom and negative freedom. Um, American political discourse is dominated by ideas of negative freedom. Freedom from government control. Freedom from being told what to do. Right. Um, positive freedom is you know, it's much more complicated. It's the sort of the freedom to create. It's the freedom to be, or uh, in, in Fromm's paradigm, freedom from, again, is the, 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 the freedom from being told what to do, from having your parents tell you, you know, what time to come home. And freedom to is the freedom to invent yourself. Uh, now, that kind of productive freedom, positive freedom, freedom to, is a freedom that depends on a fabric of society, right? which is um, which is I think where it meets safety and security, right? where it meets what the welfare state, mm -hmm. where it meets uh, ideas of interdependency, uh, and and um, you know uh, interdependency and the ideas of keeping each other safe, right? So um, so in a sense. The mask battle is this caricature of a battle between positive and negative freedom. You know, positive freedom is the kind of freedom where we take care of each other. We create the, for each other the freedom to be, um, which is why we're wearing masks. Negative freedom is the freedom from being told what to do. In American political, you know, mainstream political discourse, positive freedom just is not articulated. 
it's it's not a thing that exists. Okay. Let's end on a hopefully hopeful note, um, mm-hmm. because you're like you're you're really great at saying yeah things are bad, but let's imagine. Um, hey, what what's the name of the cat? This is Rufus. Hey, Rufus. Um, <laughs> What are you imagining for next week and the weeks to come and the months for Rufus, you, your kids, and yeah, and the rest of the country? Oh, um, okay. So, uh, so let's 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 make a distinction between optimism and hope. Please. Uh, I think hope is um, is a moral imperative. It's a precondition for democracy. Hope is where we get the idea that a different future is possible. So hope is a reason to go vote for Joe Biden, who is a vastly imperfect president, uh, presidential candidate. But I can imagine, right? Uh, that then, uh, you know, I, I mean, speaking selfishly, I can probably accomplish a lot more by criticizing Joe Biden than by criticizing Donald Trump. <clears throat> It'll be more interesting. Uh, we will all grow more. Uh, we will come up with better things. Um, optimism is is a different beast, right? Optimism is is looking at things as they are and finding uh, scenarios in which things might turn out pretty well. Um, I'm very hopeful, right? Um, and I'm cautiously optimistic, mm-hmm. very cautiously optimistic. Um, I mean, most likely next week, we're not going to know the results of the election. Right. I mean, we're going to be uh, like, there's, there's, there's the really optimistic scenario where Joe Biden wins by a landslide uh, on November 3rd, Uh, you know, he say say he wins Florida <clears throat> or Texas, and um, and that's it. And then Donald Trump tries to challenge that, be- but because because it's it's election night and the results are known, and uh, you know it's a swing state, uh, and and he takes it on the basis of an in person and early voting. It's basically over. Donald Trump's claims of a rigged election have no legitimacy. That's the best possible scenario. It's not terribly likely. What is much more likely is a protracted, messy battle to secure the results of a very imperfect election that nonetheless shows Biden to be the winner but where there is a lot of room for Trump to use his packed courts to invalidate those results and to use the uh, threat and reality of political violence in the streets to try to induce a poor peace uh, and a concession from Biden to prevent further violence. That was not the you know, happiest note we can end on, but um, thank you so much for, for sharing this um, just a few days before the election. And yeah, you're right, we will, it's gonna take weeks probably, um, maybe months, but the whole world is crossing their fingers. We all are, and hopefully we're gonna go on the street and uh, debate about Biden and Kamala Harris politics soon. I remember Judith Butler said that so beautifully when it was uh, Trump against Hillary. Um, they said, yeah, but let's go demonstrate against Hillary, right? So let's elect her, exactly. right? That's what it is about. So um, hope uh, we're all gonna be there latest in 2021. Which is soon. <laughs> Thank you so much for this talk, Masha. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, it was a real pleasure.